gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence because you have provided such a bold access through grace. I stand before you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in your sight because of what Christ did. And you have blessed us with so many spiritual blessings in the heavenlies that we could not begin to fully comprehend all that you've done for us in Christ. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we're back after, I believe, 11 days, 12 days of uh, Thanksgiving vacation. And it's good to be back, and I hope everyone out there uh, had a blessed Thanksgiving. I know I did. My uh, daughter and granddaughter and son-in-law came to visit from Texas. And so we're going to go ahead in our study here in 1 John, and we're in chapter 3. And we're soon to approach the end of the third chapter. And we've seen a lot in this study since we began in 1 John. We've seen a lot of marvelous truth that defines the Christian uh, the Christians standing before God primarily that we are of the family of God and the uh, the text has consistently drawn a drawn a, a line between the family of God and uh, those who are not of the family of God we are living in a time in which most uh, of the Christian thought that surrounds us uh, is, is based upon uh, a human perspective of what the Christian life is and that, and that there are various categories of Christians. There's the good Christians, there's the bad Christians, and then there's kind of those in between. And uh, we have not, not only have we not seen Scripture do that in our study in 1 John, but we haven't seen that in any other study that we've done in, in Paul's epistles of all the, the epistles that we've looked at and we've studied through. Human nature has been corrupted at its source, and it's, and it's been corrupted in such a way that it's incapable, fully, absolutely, completely incapable of any kind of, of self-help. Uh, man's not merely lost and in searching for a way out of his predicament. He's so lost, so completely lost, that he can no longer reckon, even recognize the, the nature of his lost condition for what it is. And I, having been a Christian for going on 35 years, it's I find it astounding how, how that so many Christians today fail to, to see the difference between law and grace. And there are only two basic positions that, that you can take in, in any of these matters that pertain to the, the Christian walk. Uh, that, man's, uh, that man's lost condition is is only partial he's not he's lost but he's really not all that lost and is god's left him with with some uh some hope of self-redemption you know that there's some faint faint glow you know in the in the uh, the embers of man's heart Which, which God uses, okay, to, to kind of fan, you know, uh, fan into a new flame. And, or that the fire has simply gone out. And, and that there's nothing which can be fanned to light. Okay, it's, it's, we're talking about total 
depravity. Uh, and which, which of these two positions that you take uh, determines your theology, it determines your worldview, your Christian worldview. I mean, do you start with man and some imagined potential for goodness? Or do you start with God who must be the, the author of salvation in its entirety? Do you start with the with the grace of God being dependent upon man's response? In which case, grace is no longer grace. Or do you start with the sovereign grace of God as the as the only basis for man's hope? Now, much of, of the modern uh, Christian worldview, you know, today, the, the basic, the primary stance of, of Christianity today is that it, it takes uh, as its starting point uh, the ability of man to respond. And, dearly beloved, not once in all of the studies that we've done, I, we're going on five years here now on, on this channel. We've, we've studied through uh, Romans and Ephesians and, you know, we've studied through, if you go, just look at our playlist, you'll see that we've spent some time in these verses. And not once have we ever seen that. Uh, I know it's alarming and, and perhaps even disturbing and upsetting to some to, to come to realize that uh, that we've just come to the end of ourselves, that there's nothing good in ourselves that, God, that would warrant, you know, God's loving favor. The, the whole idea of God's loving grace in our lives, and, that's, and, and often we, can, we will often confuse that with something else. You know, there, there are times in our lives where that we think that we are being punished by God, like God is some cruel taskmaster or he's some, uh, you know, uh, abusive parent, you know, that if we don't obey and if we don't do this right or that right or the other thing right, then, then, then he's just really, he kind of takes us to the woodshed, you know, and he whoops the heck out of us, you know, in order to try to straighten us out. I don't know a, a whole lot about raising children but what I do know is is that the love covers a multitude of sins I do know that positive reinforcement is is something that we we kind of throw about that that term you know positive reinforcement even the world you know talks about positive reinforcement and and dearly beloved it, we could almost describe the Christian life and God's relationship to us in the same way. It's positive reinforcement. Uh, we don't help a brother or a sister by, by, by picking on their faults and beating, beating them up and, and telling them how, what, what they ought to do, how they ought to straighten up their life in order to please God. What we do is we tell them that God loves them with an undying love, that He's, He died in their place, that He's, not, He doesn't allow anything to touch their lives except it be for their ultimate good, and He's working in them both the will and do of His good pleasure, that they stand before Him without spot. Can't you, dearly beloved, can't you understand how how the such words go a long way in the, in the healing process. And, and Jesus Christ is the cure for human despondency. The position of this ministry has always been and, and always will continue to be one in which 
that, that man is completely dead spiritually. And, and that all the initiative must be of God. Yeah, I, we believe that this position is the biblical one. And, and we see this as we go through these verses here in 1 John chapter 3. In verse 13 of 3, we were told, Marvel not that the world hates you. And it's because God chose us that the world hates us. And I, I pointed out how that the world in, the, in this particular context is the world, world religious system. It's not those who don't know God, you know, that, that, uh, that hate us. And they don't hate us because of what we, what we say or what we do. They hate us because God chose us. And why is that? Because it offends man's sense of self-worth and dignity. We humble ourselves at the foot of the cross. We don't come to the... It's amazing how that shortly after we're, you know... And I've heard it said many times that, you know, we came to Christ totally, completely bankrupt. Uh, we had nothing to offer Christ. But then shortly afterwards, we, we came storming the throne of grace, demanding God, God tell us, you know, what we must do for Him. And, and dearly beloved, that's just not biblical. I've been through, I've poured through this, 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 these chapters here in 1 John over and over and over again. And, and what I see is there is no middle ground. We are not looking at good Christians versus bad Christians. If, you know, there are those that God loves, there are those that, that abide in Him, there are those who keep His commandments, there are those who, you know, there are those that do all this stuff, and then there are those who don't. And I, that's not what we're seeing. There's no middle ground. The testimony of the person and the work of Jesus Christ is what we're looking at, not law. In verse 14, we know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. It doesn't say that if we love the brethren, we'll pass from death unto life. We're of the same body, members of one another, and we love one another. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. That's, that's not you. Okay? John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. And we want what we want to... What modern Christianity today wants to say is it says that if we hear His Word and if we believe on Him that God sent, then we, we have everlasting life. That's not what the verse says. It's because we have everlasting life that we hear His Word and we believe on Him. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's John 5, 24. Verse 15, Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So the Holy Spirit here couples hate with murder. And I, t I touched on that briefly. I, 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 I pointed out how that, you know, is, is, that what the, is, is that verse saying that a believer cannot commit murder. No, it's not saying that at all. Uh, David committed murder. And I've had people walk out of Bible studies because I brought up the fact that, that David committed murder and adultery and was said to be a man after God's own heart. But the Holy Spirit is drawing a line of, of distinction here throughout these verses, these, these chapters where that there's no middle ground. You're either in Christ or you're not. You're either born of God or you're not. And, and rather than dissect the body of Christ and separate 
believers into factions or, or different little tribes, you know, of, well, you've got the good ones, good Christians over here, and you got the really bad Christians over here, and then you got the ones that are sort of in between, and they're in the middle there. And God doesn't do that. We, that's what we do, but that's not what God does. Verse 16, hereby perceive, that is, we, we, we hereby know intimately the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Substitutionary death. We're reconciled by his death, folks. We are saved by his life. That saved is not redeemed, okay? I've, I've spent a lot of time talking about the distinction between that, those two uh, terms. Salvation and redemption are not synonymous with terms. We're reconciled by his death. Okay, we're saved by his life. We're justified, that is made righteous, by his obedience. And we are saved by our, our trusting, our believing in him. Okay. Uh, I find it intriguing, it's, it's probably not a strong enough word, that when we come to John 3, 1 John 3.16, it, it sort of tends to, to reflect John 3.16. You know, you've, we have John 3.16, and then we have 1 John 3.16, and, and I'm not so sure that the Holy Spirit didn't uh, plan that on purpose. I, in fact, I'm fully convinced that he did. You know, we ought to lay down our lives. That's that's all. That's plural in, there in the Greek. Uh, in, and in the Greek, that's the word who pair. It's in the place of. Okay, the brethren. Same same terminology that's used in 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 Christ laying down His life for us. That. That substitutionary death is dying in our place. The text is not saying that we ought to be a propitiation for our brother in Christ. Of course, it's not saying that. I believe the text is saying that the, the true member of the body of Christ esteems the life of his brother more than his own. You know, to lay down our lives for our, for our brother, uh, we automatically think martyrdom, you know, it's... Uh, now that it may be very well include that but I, I don't think that that's primarily the, the thought that the, the primary thought that the Holy Spirit intended to convey there for us to uh, lay down our lives you know it's, it's the the, the English, you know, reads sort of in the sense of it, it kind of denotes, it, it, it tends to, to leave us with the impression that we're laying down our lives, that is our physical lives, to death. And that's just not what, I don't, I don't see that in the text at all. But, but our lives ought to be committed, devoted, dedicated, okay, to one another in the sense that, that we esteem one another more valuable, more higher than ourselves. That your life is more important than mine. Verse 17, but whoso, whoso, that's any, any, that's uh, uh, in the Greek, that's anyone who has this world's good. Uh, the word there in the, in the Greek is, is the word where we, where the word for good there is, is bios. It's a uh, by, it's where we get, that's our word for life. Uh, necessity and sees or discerns and the word there for you know see uh, in the Greek is a word that it's used at, for a leader uh, a military commander or a leader uh, examining his troops it's it's like a military inspection if those those of you who have been in the military where the you had to line up and you were, you know, inspected, you know, whether some general inspects his troops or whatever. That's, that's the, that tends to be the meaning of the word. 
and seeth his brother have need, that is a necessity, which he knows to be a necessity, and, and shuts up his heart of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? We know that the love of God dwells in us. The Holy Spirit continues to draw a, a sharp distinction between those who are born of God and those who are not. Uh, fourth chapter, uh, and I, you know, I, I hate jumping ahead. I really, uh, if any man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that, that loves not his brother whom he's seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? But, but any, any who have this world's necessities and discerns his brother who has an, a necessity and uh, shuts up his heart of compassion from him, how can he say that the love of God abides in him? Uh, it just, well, it doesn't. As I've said, there is no middle ground here. There is no reason, folks, to read through these verses and these chapters and try and, un and with with some while while making some attempt to try to to read our own human performance into these verses. Well, it doesn't seem like I love God very much, or it doesn't seem like I love the brother very much. It doesn't seem like I abide. I'm not, I don't know if I'm really truly abiding in him or not. And folks, the text says you are. And the wonders of his grace and, and God pointing out the fact that, that by being born of God, of incorruptible seed, we have a new nature, a sinless new nature, which cannot sin. Cannot sin. And and if we don't go through here uh, with the understanding of the fact that God expects nothing of the old, the old man, the sin nature, the flesh, the flesh profits nothing. We have nothing to offer God. In the flesh. The new man is, is fully righteous. He, the new man is created in righteousness and true holiness. What more folks could you want? The, these verses are not meant to be looked at as, as we're not meant to go through the, these chapters and these verses and and divide Christians into groups, you know, where these are the bad Christians and these are the good Christians, and, and maybe there are some in between. What is true of me is true of you. Why can't Christians come to grips with the fact that we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ? That what is true of me is true of you. And what is true of you is true of me. My little children, verse 18, a term of endearment. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. Well, just, just go to James. You know, a back pat, you know, a handshake or a hug and just send them on their way, you know, saying everything will be okay. You know, hey, I love you. Hope things work out fine. You know, no. Indeed and in truth. I believe this is what the new man does. I believe words are connected with our deeds and I believe tongue is connected to truth. And I believe that what we do is coupled with what we say. You know, if you remember Ephesians 4.28, let him that, that steal, steal no more. Now, you can look at that as, well, you know, you, know, you stole, you know, I don't know. What did you, you, you stole a pack of gum from a convenience store. You know, I don't know. Uh, you stole your neighbor's lawn mower, okay, you know, or his his rake, you know, or his shovel or whatever. You stole your neighbor's chainsaw. 
Now you can look at it that way, I, and I and I'm not going to suggest that that's not that there's it doesn't carry some sense of meaning there with that, but but I don't really think that's primarily the thought of the Holy Spirit in that verse. It's let him that stole, okay, steal no more it is being contrasted with. Let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. And we see how that, that, that seems to be tied into our, our laying down our lives for our brethren. Uh, if you just simply come here and, and just say, okay, I, I like what Steve is saying and I believe what he's saying, I think I'll just run with that. Okay, And, and you don't really do your own homework. On this on these matters and you you don't spend much time in the in the word you just sort of allow I, I remember years ago uh, I had mentioned something to one of my art students uh, in a drawing class and we were t we got to talking about things you know uh, spiritual things and and she was kind of alarmed or shocked at something that I said and she says I don't know if I I don't know if I believe that or I need to I, I need to ask my pastor I'll ask my pastor about that. That's what she told me. I'll ask my pastor about that. Uh, I have strongly advised people not to believe something just because I believe it. If you remember... Back in Ephesians, when we studied through Ephesians, we're to, we're to labor, working with our hands, the thing which is good, I believe. I believe that this is what is good, okay? This is my hands. This is the labor. This is what's good. Okay, that's, that's how I, I interpret the verse. Now, you may not, but that's how I look at that. And while at the same time, I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't go steal our neighbor's lawnmower. Okay, and, and if we if we want a lawnmower, we ought to get a job, work, and buy a lawnmower. I mean, it, it just kind of goes without saying. But I think often we get away from the spiritual context of everything, and we look at things from a human perspective, uh, an earthly, uh, material, physical uh, sort of you know context. Uh, So we can't separate our words from our deeds in this verse. And uh, we can communicate, though, to the necessity, the needs of a brother in many, many ways. You know, we don't just say, well, I love you. You know, We couple what we say with what we do. And, and I believe that truth is the word of God. And sometimes all you can do is minister the truth. God will, God does supply all of your needs, all of our needs. I think oftentimes what we'll do is we'll try to counsel others, you know, and especially couples. You know, it's, it's kind of a tricky business. I, On why you know why that they're suffering, okay? You know, you, uh, by saying that the, the reason why they're going through these difficult circumstances, these hardships, these is because they're sinning. You know, that they're, that they're not doing something right. You know, beating them down. Oh, dearly beloved, these are members of the same body. These are our, our brothers and, the, and, and our sisters in Christ. I believe that the, the 19th and the 20th verse are the same sentence. Uh, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure, that is, that's pytho there, that's persuade our hearts before him. I am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Uh, same word there. 
uh, because when our heart condemn us, and and that's uh, kata gnosko. That's that's a it's an experiential uh, down from above experiential. You know the the word is denotes. Uh, you know, let me just say that there's. It reminds you of Romans 8.1. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So when our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So even though our heart may condemn us, which I believe it does, it will at times. Uh, if it doesn't, you're quite an extraordinary person. Okay. So when it does, we know when our heart does condemn us, we know God's doesn't. We know God doesn't condemn us. I believe that's to be what the verse is saying. And then we come to verses 21 through 24, I believe, which conclude the chapter. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, whatsoever, well, it's, we receive of him. Because we keep keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, and it's and there's no wonder. It's I find it. it I don't. It's hard to. I don't know how to put this. Uh, it's little wonder that the church today primarily uh, has adopted this position on prayer and asking and receiving and all. Uh, that that is one in which God. Well, you know, you've got the good Christians, okay? They're doing everything right. And they, they've been good little boys and girls. And so God will, will grant them whatever they ask because they keep his commandments. And they, they do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And, and, and these other, this other group of his children over here, they're, well, they're, not, they're, they're not such good children. And, and so that's not true of them. And, and again, I don't see... I don't see uh, I don't see any middle ground here. It is true that our heart will condemn us at times, and we need to know that God does not condemn us. But when it comes to our heart condemning us not, and which results in confidence toward God. Uh, we know better than to suggest, even dare suggest, that whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. And that, well, of course, that means, uh, you know, a horse, a horse ranch, you know, with a lot of cattle and, you know, maybe a cabin down by a, a clear uh, blue stream, you know, and I don't know, silver spurs, you know, whatever else you want to throw in there, you know. A pretty wife and, you know, you know Kids that never do anything wrong, and you know, a, a, a new job, you know, a new pickup, whatever, you know, whatsoever, whatsoever we ask, we receive of it, and we do it, we receive it because we we guard his commandments, and we've already seen, folks, in this con in this chapter, that we gu we guard his commandments. If if you if you're not born of God, if if you don't guard his commandments, you're not born of God. And when we talk about doing those things that are pleasing in his sight, we have to stop and ask ourselves, does the old man, the flesh, the carnal nature, the sin nature, does it, is, is there anything good in it? Do, is there anything in the flesh that pleases God? And of course, we know the answer to that is no. No. On the contrary, the new man the sinless new man can do nothing but please God. Because the, the new man is fully righteous. It cannot sin. It doesn't have the ability. It doesn't have the, the power to sin. And it is... God accept, accepts nothing from the flesh. So we do do those things. The, the new man does those things which is pleasing in his sight. The new man keeps, guards, is the word, his commandments. Okay, The new man is the only one that's going to ever have any confidence toward God. The new man 
is is the one is is the only one that is not going to condemn us. Okay. Is the verse saying that we can just ask for whatever we want, whatever we can just fulfill our, I don't know, Christmas is coming up. We've got this long Santa Claus list of things, you know, we want to ask God, you know, that he'll do. You know, like, yeah, I want my wife back. I want my, my, my children uh, safe I want, or I want my children uh, to love me. You know, I want my, I, just without without wasting a lot of time going down some stupid list in my head this folks is not anywhere near what these words are 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 suggesting in my opinion as i understand this this context this this passage this ver these verses this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son jesus christ okay and love one another as he gave us commandment. So faith, okay, and love. And, and if we go back and we look at the confidence to, that we have toward God, the new man, you, you, that confidence is related to hope. You've got faith, hope, and love. right there, All right there together. Faith, hope, and love. What does the old man, the sin nature, have to do with faith, hope, and love? Nothing. If you have any hope, any faith, any love, it is it is a byproduct of that new man, that sinless new man that you possess in Christ. And he that keepeth his commandments, that's us, dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us. We know that he abides in us. How? Why? Why do, how do we know that he abides in us? Because we're looking outwardly at uh, our circumstances and we're, you know, I don't know, patting ourselves on the back, priding ourselves in our accomplishments, you know, that... We know that he abides in us by the stuff that we do. No. We know that he abides in us, you know, because, you know, of all the, you know, uh, all the things that, that I'm, uh, well, maybe you get the point. We know that he abides in us by the spirit which he's given us. The Spirit, which He has given us. And that, uh, that no is, uh, I would have to look at that. I, uh, when I got down close to the end of the verse, end of the chapter here, I kind of got astray away from the Greek somewhat. the very last verse if I could just take us over into the Greek and by this we know and that is gnosko that is an experiential knowledge that he abides in us and that that's a perfect again that's we've seen so many perfect passives a perfect tense he abides that is uh, he's uh, an action occurred sometime in the past with the results continuing on into the present and the spirit which he has given and that's an heiress that's a, it's a one time it's the heiress tense not related to time but uh, heiress active indicative he has given us Hereby we know that he abides in us by the Spirit which he has given us. The Spirit. You can't fake that. Okay? You can't fake the Spirit.
Uh, I remember back in Philippians, we were studying through there, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in us will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. We saw Paul uh, as a, a prisoner of the Lord, a bond slave. Uh, he was the prototype, you know, of, of all of us who would believe. It's, it, I, it's interesting to come out of all those epistles of, of Paul into this first epistle of John. You know, the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we read that, and we go, well, so he must have loved, I guess he loved John more than he loved Peter or James or, or surely, folks, you don't believe that, in that nonsense. If you, if you want to step in line with mainstream Christianity and go down this path of, this, of believing that, you know, that, uh, Somehow grace is this, well, grace is this, grace is grace, but it's, but it's also, you know, this grace is, well, when, when we can't handle it anymore, we've been doing good, we've been doing really fine and on our own and, you know, doing, we've been accomplishing quite a bit on our own and, uh, but, you know, we don't always do that and so sometimes we fail and when we fail then God's grace steps in and picks us up, picks up where we left off, and it kind of, you know, it's sort of like God's grace is we fumble the ball, and God picks it up and runs for a touchdown, you know. I've often said how that stated how I, my belief is that, that we throw words around so loosely, like grace and faith and uh, reckoning, you know, well, yeah, rec I tried, I tried, Steve, I tried to reckon myself dead to sin, I, I just, and I just kept on sinning, you know, the verse doesn't say that if you uh, re reckon yourself dead to sin, that uh, you'll stop sinning, it's you reckon yourself dead to sin, because you can't stop sinning, because that's all the old man does, Look, I love you all. I truly do. It's great to be back. Uh, the weather here in uh, southeastern Oklahoma is really nice for this time of year. I'm afraid we've got some really cold weather coming in January, probably some snow. I'll probably be in, stuck inside for the most part, but I, we're going to continue on in our study through First uh, John. I just want you all to know I love you. I truly do. I truly do, and I, and I hope that you all had a very safe and happy Thanksgiving, and uh, rest in Him, dearly beloved. Rest in Him. God has nothing against us. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.